Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salamu ala rasulullah, ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala thamma amma ba'a to proceed. Um, so now inshallah we'll go over Bab Qital Ahl al-Baghi or the chapter on fighting the insurgent rebels. And certainly it's a very sort of hot, pertinent, uh, relevant topic nowadays. Uh, not necessarily for Muslim minorities. Uh, but for the Muslim majority countries. Um, Imam Abdul Qadam, rahimahullah, in his book Amdat al Fiqh, which is a Hanbali manual, uh, said in the, uh, you know, under the Bab Qital al Baghi or the chapter on fighting the insurgent rebels, Again, فَإِنْ آلَى إِلَى قَتْلِهِمْ أَوْ تَلَفِ مَالِهِمْ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَى الدَّافِعِ وَإِنْ قُتِلَ الدَّافِعِ كَانَ شَهِيدًا These are the insurgents who rebel against the Imam, rightful ruler. And keep, like I did not translate this as just ruler. I only translated this as rightful ruler. Uh, and we'll come back to say why. Uh, wanting to depose him. Uh, the Muslims are required to support their Imam in deterring them by the lightest means sufficient for deterrence. If this results in a fight against them or the destruction of their property, there is no liability on the defender. And if the defender dies, he is a martyr. So if you fight alongside the rightful ruler against the insurgent rebels and get killed, you'll be a martyr. Uh, maybe we should finish uh, everything and then just have like a sort of a, a discussion afterwards. Uh, but let us first make sure that uh, things are clear here. Uh, okay, so وَهُمُ الْخَارِجُونَ عَلَى imam. These are the insurgents who rebel against the imam. Uh, insurgents who rebel against the imam. Wanting to depose him. So these are Ahl al-Baghi that uh, are to be killed, uh, are to be fought against and to be killed. Where is this coming from? What is the definition of Ahl al-Baghi? What is the definition of the Imam? Uh, and certainly there would be some need for uh, shedding some light on contemporary uh, circumstances and scenarios. Uh, but first, let us be completely uh, sort of faithful to the tradition, not only the scriptures, because we will have to always be faithful to the scriptures, but let us go over the tradition as it is, and then, you know, discuss the tradition or analyze it critically. Uh, now, and the tradition here also, according to the Hanbali Mazhab mainly, so al kharijuna ala al imam so ahl al baghi are basically in order for them to be ahl al baghi they have to be uh, a group that has shawka uh, that has uh, basically power if they have no power they are not ahl al baghi they are bandits they will be treated like qutatuk like highwaymen and certainly the difference here, it's a hairline difference between the two, Ahl al-Baghi and Qutta al-Turuq. Uh, if, you know, if, it, if people, you know, have the same cause, the same understanding or misunderstanding, and they are 20,000, armed people, and the imam feels that they have power, we call them Ahl al-Baghi. Those are insurgent rebels. And they get a completely different set of rulings, as we will discuss, from bandits. People, if that number is 2,000, I'm just giving any numbers, but it, it is about, you know, do they have shawka? Do they have power to be reckoned with or not? 
if the, it is 2,000 people, they have the same understanding like the 20,000. Uh, or it is 20,000, but they are lightly armed. <laughs> the other 20,000 are heavily armed. The lightly armed will be called bandits. The heavily armed will be called insurgent rebels. They have the same, uh, it's, they have the same motives. Uh, they have the same understanding. Just the difference is that these have power, these don't have power. When they don't have power, you treat them like bandits. When they have power, and yeah, that's what it is. When they have power, you treat them like trebles. Two completely different sets of rules. Now, not only that they have to have power, but they have to have to wheel sa'ar. They have to have sort of some substantiation for their rebellion. Uh, it is not like they are, that we'll say, uh, meaning what? Like, let's say they are Khawarij, for instance. Uh, you have Khawarij that make the fear of all the Muslimin and so on. They have a different set of rules as well. And, and that's a controversial issue. We, we, we may talk about it a little bit later. But the idea here is that they have to have some grievances against the system. They are rebelling because of grievances. Those grievances may not be justifiable completely, but there are grievances that, that people will consider to be, you know, will think about. There is some ta'wil, there is some point. Even if this ta'wil is weak, but they have some point here, and that is, uh, the issue of motive or incentive catalyst of the rebellion. There has to be some point. Uh, the rebellion has to be against a rightful ruler Rightful ruler here is Imam. It's not necessarily Imam Adil or just ruler. It is only rightful ruler. Because according to the established position in the Hanbali Mazhab, it is impermissible to rebel against an unjust ruler, which we will come to talk about. Al Khuruj al Al Hakim al Za'ir. Because we have three different types of rulers, al-hakim, al-adil, and there is consensus here that you cannot rebel against him. Al-hakim, al-ja'ir, and that is the, 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 the sort of the point of contention here. This jawr could be transient, random, could be consistent, and sort of huge and, and, and consistent, you know, jawr all the time, jaw, like extreme jawr all the time. We must make the distinction here. Some of the scholars made the distinction between these two. Al Juwaini and Ghiyasi the, made the distinction between Al Hakim al Fasiq al Ja'ir, whose fisq is random, and the Hakim al Fasiq al Ja'ir, whose fisq is permanent and enormous. Uh, and then you have al-Hakim al-Kafir, and there is consensus here that you rebel against them. And of course, this is in Muslim lands. Uh, so there is agreement here, there is agreement here, there is a lot of controversy here. Well, according to the Hanbali Mazhab, you do not, the Hanbali Mazhab do not allow rebelling against the Ja'ir. Now there are two reports in the Hanbali Mazhab. One report, one report, that Imam Ahmad said if they can depose him, 
they should. And that was reported for Tabaqat by Ibn Abi Ya'la. And then the more common and more popular position of Imam Ahmad and more often repeated or quoted position of Imam Ahmad is to prohibit uh, rebelling against the unjust ruler. Some people say that Imam Ahmad had these two positions in different contexts and that the default for him is the permissibility of rebelling against unjust rulers when there is no greater harm to be expected. Of the greatest Hanbalis who actually favor that narration, the permissibility of rebelling, are Abu Razin and Ibn Aqil and Ibn al-Jawzi. But we have to be clear. This is not the authorized position. This is not the popular position. They say that Imam Ahmad prohibited rebelling against the ruler within the context of his mihna. You know, al mamun had this interpretation about Khalq al-Qur'an and, and so on, and they basically uh, persecuted Imam Ahmad, as everybody knows. When people came to ask Imam Ahmad if they should rebel within that context, and Imam Ahmad had in his memory, it was fresh in his memory, the fighting between Al-Amin and Ma'moon, the two brothers, that caused so much bloodshed and the destruction to Baghdad, he was telling them, no, don't. You should not. Uh, but when it comes to you know, the, his default position, uh, according to the, you know, Ibn Aqeel, Ibn Jawzi, and Abu Razin, and so on, his uh, the default position uh, is the permissibility when there is no greater harm to be expected. Uh, now, so, so now we have in the Hanbari Madhab, these are the, the three, uh, basically, the, in order for people to be called the Bogha, insurgent rebels, and for the rules that we will mention to apply to them, they have to have power, otherwise they would be rebels. Uh, they, they will be bandits. Uh, they have to have some incentive, some motive, some uh, sort of substantiation for their rebellion, uh, whether it is strong or not, but something that they would cite, that they would talk about, that would make some sense, you know, even if it is not strong. And they have to be rebelling against a rightful ruler. And as we said, so it would not apply to this. You know, uh, it, it would certainly apply to this. And according to the authorized position in the Hanbali Madhab, it would apply to this, the unjust ruler as well. Is that clear? In the Hanbali Madhab, how does a ruler become a ruler? How does a ruler become a ruler? And this is the majority, that this is the traditional position in, you know, in our tradition. Because there is a huge difference, not a huge difference, I shouldn't say that. There is a difference between tradition and scriptures. There is a difference even between Salaf and Khalaf. There is a difference between what was popular during the time of this righteous predecessors with regard to this issue and what became sort of is the established tradition during the time of al Khalaf. So we have to keep that in mind. So the ruler in the Hanbali Madhab, Tathbut al Imama, Bil Ijma, and they cite Abu Bakr's Imama because all the Sahaba agreed. Tathbut al Imama bin Nas, which means actually Al Ahd. One imam passing the imamship on to the next. And they cite Abu Bakr passing it on to Omar. Now Ibn Taymiyyah will disagree, but his position is not the authorized position in the madhab here. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah would say that the imam of Omar was not ratified except through the acceptance of the Sahaba. It was not ratified by the mere transfer of imamship from Abu Bakr to him. 
It was only ratified by the acceptance of the Sahaba. But in the authorized position in the Hanbali Mazhab, the Imama can be transferred from one Imam to the next without the need for the approval by Ahl al-Hal wa al-Aqd. They actually state this without the need for approval by Ahl al-Hal al-Aqd. That is Bin Nas. And they cite between Abu Bakr and Umar. And Bil Ijtihad. And they cite that Umar radiallahu anhu uh, instructed them to choose one of six people and that they made ijtihad among themselves and they chose Uthman. And Bil Qahr, which is Imamat al Mutaghalib, by uh, basically domination. Someone dominates, they become an Imam and they become the rightful ruler. Even if he rebelled against the rightful ruler, but he dominated. So he may have been a fasiq yesterday, but today he's the imam and you make dua for him. But that is the tradition. That is it. So and we have to respect is their reasoning. You have to respect their reasoning. In the whole world, it was completely anomalous what happened after the Prophet ﷺ for 40 years. This was not the case in Persia. This was not the case in the Byzantine Empire. This was not the case anywhere. This idea of people choosing their leader is like a, a very, it was a very sort of uh, extraordinary idea. Now you have pressure from the past you know, like Arab culture, you have pre pressure from the sort of the, the geographical, the context, you know, Byzantine Empire and Roman Empire, and all of this pressure, you know, amounted to departure from that model, from that type, which happened only after 40 years, and ever since we have been in a constitutional crisis. As a, as a nation, uh, because Bil Qahr meant that if you dominate, you are the rightful Imam. That would allow every sort of, like, that would allow the use of force to be the last de determinant of who the rightful Imam is. And it becomes a gamble. Like, if you are defeated, you will you know, be the insurgent tribal or the bandit, depends on whether you have the power or not. Uh, if you are, if you win, you will be the rightful imam. So it's a big gamble. So you can imagine if the Abbasis, for instance, lost the war against the Umayyads, the whole history would have changed. The Abbasis would have been always remembered as Bugha insurgent tribals. Uh, so Bil Qahr. That's it. You know, this, 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 or that. Now, uh, well, uh, let's finish the tradition and then we can talk about, uh, unless it's disambiguation. So now, this Tathbut to whom they said, Le Qurashay, Zakar, Adl, Alim, Kafin. So it, then it, these are the, uh, basically the sort of uh, the, uh, what? The procedures for the imama to be established. Then if we have those procedures, the imama will be established for someone from Quraysh with uh, Different circumstances, they actually showed flexibility with this because they accepted the Ottomans. Uh, and the, they, had, they had ways to, to justify this. The Prophet ﷺ said if it is an Abyssinian uh, who, who was a slave, then became an, uh, a Khalifa, then alaykum you listen and you obey. Then they said zakar, which means male, uh, 
And they have not really traditionally compromised on this that much. But I'm quite sure that you'll have scholars in, in places like Pakistan or Bangladesh where they have the head of the state as a, a woman. They, you probably had some scholars justify it. And certainly, in, you know, the people who are in, inclined, more, more sort of inclined to modern interpretations will be able to justify, or even in Egypt, Sheikh al-Ghazali, for instance, uh, Sheikh Mohammed al-Ghazali said that it is okay, and uh, Bilqis was a great uh, leader, and, and so on and so forth. Had they, they, they actually showed flexibility with this a long time ago. <laughs> so, because uh, because uh, Imam Ahmad clearly stated, barran kana aw fajiran, whether he is uh, uh, righteous or wicked. Alim, they, they, they compromised on this. Uh, because we, like after al Khulafa al-Rashidin, uh, it was rare that you get a, a, you know, a Khalifa who is also a scholar at the same time. It was not unheard of, but it was rare. Kafin uh, means competent, you know, competent. And competent here, uh, they also showed some compromise here in, like, in interesting ways. Like if you are in and out of insanity, They'll say, most of the time, are you sane or insane? If you're most of the time sane, they'll let you go. They'll, they'll pass it. Which allowed for us, historically, to be ruled by completely deranged people. <laughs> like Al-Hakim Ba'amrillah, who burnt the uh, Holy uh, Sepulcher uh, and brought about death and destruction for, to Muslims for 200 years. Although, to be honest, it was a dharia. It was basically like an excuse for the crusaders to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to conquer uh, uh, the, our lands. But, uh, and certainly, it did not justify any of uh, their, their huge sort of uh, massacres and oppression uh, and transgression. But, Again, at the same time, you would allow you allowed someone who is deranged to rule over you. He is the same guy who burned Cairo, by the way. He burned Cairo down. Uh, so, anyway, they say that if uh, they say that if you don't have arms and legs, you're not you're not good enough uh, to be an imam. If you don't, uh, you, you couldn't have basically a weak vision, but if you're blind, no. And certainly many of you, well not many of you, but some of you may remember the old sort of Egyptian, uh, uh, sort of Islamist, the jihadi groups having this huge uh, controversy over Imamat al-Darir and Imamat al-Asir and you know, the, the, the leadership of the blind, the leadership of the captive, used to be a big controversy between al-Jihad and the Jamal Islamiyya and so on. Uh, but then they said, if, if you don't have taste or smell, that's fine. We don't need that. Uh, if, uh, if you're most of the time insane, but you get in and out of it, if you're most of the time sane, but you're in and out, that's OK. We can let you be. Um, if you are, uh, what? If you, if you have a, like a little hearing problem, but you still can hear, um, you would be fine. Um, so they, they, yeah, so they showed a lot of flexibility with this competency. They showed flexibility with this. They showed flexibility with this. Traditionally, they have not showed flexibility with the male-female issue, but in modern times, they have showed flexibility uh, with this. Uh, Qurashi, uh, traditionally they have not, but in not modern times, in, you know, for v uh, several hundred years, they have, under the Ottoman Empire, showed flexibility uh, here. So now, if you are established as a rightful ruler, rightful ruler, not necessarily just, but rightful ruler, uh, you can, you, you, they cannot rebel against you. Uh, the, and, and then in order for people to be bogha, 
we have to have them rebel against the rightful ruler, whether he's wicked or, or good. Uh, they have to have some sort of uh, some just, uh, substantiation for their rebellion, and they have to have. Them. They miss any of these. They are not the boga that we're talking about them in this particular chapter. And you will find that, you know, uh, so certainly, and I, I'm trying to keep myself also in mind, I, 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 you know, I love, I embrace our tradition uh, beyond your imagination. And I believe that it is beautiful. Um, but when it comes to our political philosophy, I think it is very underdeveloped. And you could notice the frustration on my tone. Uh, but uh, please don't, don't misunderstand this to, be, to mean any disrespect. They were working under different circumstances. Whatever it is that we, our failure to develop our political philosophy is what makes me frustrated. I understand that they worked under pressure. I understand that they had different circumstances. I understand that they have accepted uh, sort of that they had some fiqh tarar or sort of exceptional circumstances uh, that we have turned into over centuries. And I'm not talking about contemporary people only, but over century we, centuries we have turned into fiqh tarar into fiqh uh, We have turned in the exception into the default. And we have turned the tarikh into wahy as well. Uh, if you look at how they, how the, they sort of establish procedures for imamship, it is about tarikh. It's about, you know, between Abu Bakr and Omar, between Omar and Uthman, between Uthman. And then, you know, whoever dominates, it's tarikh. It is tarikh that is being justified. Uh, and certainly, certainly, uh, you will, uh, with hindsight, you will retrospectively, uh, or not retrospectively, uh, when you want to justify this, you will find textual reports. Some people made up textual reports. We know that Wada used to exist. But you may find textual reports that are actually re traceable to the Prophet ﷺ and interpret them in a way that fits your worldview. Yes, reverse engineering. That completely fits your worldview and completes, completely allows you to be at peace with your reality. You know, because it's just, you know, these are times where the whole world uh, lived under monarchies and, you know, you, you know the, the, the evil triad in Europe and, uh, and all of that stuff which made people rebel. And, so th that was the world around them. Now you're looking at it from a completely different perspective. So, you, you know, and you're looking at, you know, democracies here and there and people holding their leaders accountable and institutions, separation of powers and all of that stuff. But during the time of Imam ibn Qudama, where was that? I mean, you know, separation of powers and institutions, all of that, these were monarchies they were being attacked by the Crusaders. They were being attacked by Richard of the Lionhearted. They wanted to maintain the solidarity of the Muslims. And they wanted to So a di completely different perspective. So we have, despite our frustration with the departures that our tradition had ex seen or experienced from the scriptures and from the Islamic ideals, we have to maintain our respect for our imams and scholars. If, you, if, you, if we compromise that, it will, the, you know, it will be a snowball. And it, it will end up with, we will end up in a very, very perilous, dangerous, undesirable place. OK. Now. Then these bugha, these are the rules for these bugha, and then we can come back and talk about uh, what we think about, you know, the, the way forward. For these bugha who fulfilled these conditions, 
ذا شيخ سد ولا يتبع لهم مدبر ولا يجهر على ولا يجهز ام سوري على جريح ولا يغنم لهم مال ولا تسبى لهم ذرية ومن قتل منهم غسل وكفنا وصلي عليه. Those of them who retreat should not be pursued and those who are wounded should not be killed. Their property is not seized as war spoils and their families are not enslaved. Those of them who are killed should, should be washed, shrouded and have a janaza, funeral prayer offered for them. Very kind. Because many times, those bugha that were considered bugha were of the best of this ummah. You know, because at the end of the day, Al Hussein rebelled, Ibn al Zubayr rebelled, Abdul Rahman ibn al Ashas rebelled, him and the Qurra, the best, the cream of the crop of the Tabi'een. Uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn al Hassan rebelled, Sahab al Nafs al Zakiya. Uh, you know, whose rebellion has been supported by Abu Hanifa and Malik. Uh, Ibrahim uh, ibn Abdullah ibn al-Hassan rebelled. Uh, so we're talking about the cream of the crop, the people who rebelled during the time of the righteous generations were the cream of the crop. Uh, but anyway, so, ولا ضمان على أحد على أحد الفريقين فيما أتلف حال الحرب من نفس أو مال. Neither of the two parties is held liable for damage to lives and properties that they caused during the war. Uh, now, whatever you have caused during the war, damage you have caused, this is basically like the civil war in America when they decided that the way forward is basically to just move forward. Uh, and this was extremely smart. America would have never been one country had they had the North, uh, I mean, and, and certainly, you know, they're, they're, uh, this has many aspects, I guess. Uh, but, but in general, in general, had the North used their victory to humiliate the South, uh, it would have never been a one country. It, likewise, they say that if there is rebellion, the way forward is basically not to look backward. Whatever happened has happened. Let's move forward. Let's subdue the rebels, the insurgent rebels, uh, in the interest of the Union and move forward. So neither of the two parties is held liable for damage to lives and properties that they caused during the war. In fact, uh, Imam Ali radiallahu anhu, or Ali radiallahu anhu said, whoever finds their mata with someone else, they are more entitled to it. So, you know, after al-Jamal, some of the people who were fighting against Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, they found a qidr, like a, a pot, a, a huge pot, that mm, the, you know, the, the people, were, the supporters of Ali were using to cook food. So someone from the opposite army recognized that it is theirs. So they demanded to take it back. So they said to them, now Ali won. They said to them, uh, give us time to finish cooking and we'll give it back to you. And they insisted to take it before they finished. So they spilled the food and they took their pot. Uh, so it, it just shows you that uh, they were very visionary people, by the way, because that is, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of forbearance and a lot of helm to do this. Uh, now we want to bring healing, uh, not more division. <sighs> then the Sheikh said, وَمَا أَخَذَ الْبُغَى حَالَ امْتِنَاعِهِمْ مِنْ زَكَاةٍ أَوْ جِزْيَةٍ أَوْ خَرَاجٍ لَمْ يُعَدْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا عَلَى الدَّافِعِ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يُنْقَصُ وَلَا يُنْقَضُ مِنْ حُكْمِ حَاكِمِهِمْ إِلَّا مَا يُنْقَضُ مِنْ حُكْمِ غَيْرِهِ. Uh, 
whatever the rebels had taken while in power, zakat uh, or jizya uh, or kharaj, is not collected from them or from those who paid them. The judgments issued by their judges are not re reversed except in the same way as judgments of any other uh, judges would be. Okay, so these people were in control. The Boga were in control over a certain area. They acted like rulers. They had those rebels were in control of a certain area. They acted like rulers. They collected the jizya, kharaj, and zakat. They set up judges. Those judges adjudicated over many cases for years. Now we recaptured that region. What do we do with all the judgments that were passed by their judges? We keep them. Unless they, unless they can be revoked by any, you know, even uh, by our judges. When can they be revoked by our judges, uh, even if they were passed by our judges? If they are in complete conflict with, you know, the clear, explicit text or the consensus. But if there is uh, some ijtihad, possible ijtihad, we don't reverse the rulings. We do not recollect the zakat, kharaj, or jizya that they collected we consider them to be just sort of, we consider all of this to be valid. Uh, now zakat, all you need to do, like if, if, the, if the agents of the rightful imam come to you, you only you need to, to say is, they took it. Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar used to pay, give his zakat to Najd al-Haruri. Uh, you know, like s some Kharijite who, who uh, took over for, for, for some time and he used to send agents and they would pay their zakat to Najd al-Haruri. Uh, so all you need to say, they took it. We don't have to establish any proof. Kharaj and Jizya, because they are compensation for something, you need to establish proof. You need to show uh, a proof that they collected the kharaj and jizya. Zakat is an act of worship anyway. Uh, but that's it. Um, so we don't reverse the rulings. And we validate uh, whatever uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, practices. Uh, governing practices of theirs when they were in control and when they had power. So let me go over, we'll draw a line now. Now I'm gonna speak my mind. Uh, so what is, what is this? Like what, uh, certainly, the, the Muslim Ummah has been in a constitutional crisis for about 1,400 years. <laughs> so it's, not, it's nothing new. Uh, and, uh, because the legitimacy of the, the dominant uh, sort of ruler uh, will make you know, the, the legitimacy of the governance, the government, up for grabs all the time whoever can dominate. Uh, and it's such a, a prescription for like crisis. Uh, because the, 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 the FASIC that we are calling FASIC today because they are rebelling against the rightful ruler will become the Amir al-Mu'mineen tomorrow that you will have to pray for and, and so on. And that is the dominant sort of, uh, that's the dominant view in the tradition. As we said, or let's just go back, and anyone who wants to leave, please uh, go ahead, because I'm just gonna take some time to explain this issue in some detail. So, now, does Islam have any system of governance? Oh, 
Now, people have different uh, ideas about this. We have, just like usual, we have three different categories of people. We have people who are secular and mashayikh that would uh, basically also support like a more secular perspective. And they are mashayikh. They are trained to be mashayikh. So we will have to call them mashayikh. Uh, so according to this line, there is no system of governance prescribed by Islam. And who would pioneer or champion this? Uh, in the tradition, you don't see a lot of people. I mean, unless you're talking about people that, you know, philosophers, and you're talking about Ikhwan uh, safa you're talking about uh, also Kharijais that said that there is no imamship and there is no requirement for imamship in Islam. And, and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but in general, uh, this is more like a secular discourse that is supported by some mashayikh. Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak, rahimahullah, is the one who is usually remembered here uh, to be in support of this position, that there is no system of governance in Islam whatsoever. Uh, Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak was an Azhari Sheikh, a good, decent Azhari Sheikh who learned in Oxford as well, uh, you know. Uh, and, uh, and he was from the upper Egypt. And he was known to be righteous, by the way. Like, people who have met him, particularly closer to the end of his life, they have uh, basically reported that this was a righteous man, a good man, righteous man, muhafaz ala salawat, you know, and, and so on. So Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak wrote a book after the, is the, the Khilafah uh, was basically uh, voided or the Khilafah was terminated by Hizb uh, al-Tahad al-Taraqi in Turkey, and he wrote a book called Al-Islam wa Usul al-Hukm. Al-Islam wa Usul al-Hukm. So Islam and uh, basically theories of governance or uh, ways of, of governance. And in this book, Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak argues that there is no prescription whatsoever in Islam for how uh, to rule. There is prescription for justice, there is prescription for kindness, there is prescription for this or that, but there is no prescription whatsoever. Islam does not provide guidance in this regard. Khilafah is not, uh, does not have backing in the Quran and uh, the Sunnah, the system of Khilafah. Uh, does not have any backing in the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, it is said that the Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak, it is said that the Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak uh, was under the influence of sort of party politics in Egypt, and because Al Malik Fuad, who is King Fuad, at the, King Fuad at the time, was an Egyptian king, wanted to claim the Khilafah after Turkey uh, gave it up. So King Fuad said, well, it's about time for Egypt to resume its place in the Muslim world as the center of the heart of the Muslim world. Uh, and then he had interest in claiming the Khilafah after Turkey gave it up. Now, there was in, in, sort of internal sort of politics, in Egyptian politics. And Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak was against King Fuad. And he did not want King Fuad basically to uh, get that honor. Uh, of being the Khalifa. And they say that he wrote that book. It is quite clear that Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak and Taha Hussein, who is a, a sort of a controversial modern figure in Egypt, uh, let me say, uh, 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 were friends. And it's quite clear that uh, even Taha Hussein himself admits to have contributed to the book. Now, did Tahsin write the whole book or contributed, to, or just contributed to the book? It, it is controversial, but I don't think that he just wrote the whole book. There are different reports here, and people narrate different things, uh, even from personal uh, communications with Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak. Uh, but let us say that uh, the, the Tahsin contributed 
uh, to the book, or the moderns in Egypt contributed to the book. And there were, and Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak, towards the end of his life, basically um, disavowed much of what was written in the book. Now, to be honest with you, Dr. Saad al-Din Uthmani, or Saad al-Din al-Uthmani, who was a prime minister in, in Morocco, who is an Islamist and a good man, um, certainly he has great history, uh, wrote a book called Dawla al-Islamiyya al mafhum al-Imkan, and wrote a book called The Deen al-Siyasa, Tamiz al and wrote several books that are very close to Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak's thesis. His thesis in those books are very close to, or his theses in those books are very close to Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak's thesis. So should we put him here, or should we put him here, or should we put him in the middle? You know, why is it that Islamists in general were much kinder to him? Because he is one of them. <laughs> and although his thesis is counter to sort of uh, Islamist agenda, uh, it's just that he it, usually, you know, personal relationships, don't think that everything is, is just merely intellectual. There is a huge room for sort of personal uh, and, 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 and that may also be a little bit unfair because Saad al-Din al-Uthmani and Shahab Ali Abdul Razak also was a righteous man. You know, it, it, it's, it's difficult anyway. But, but uh, Saad al-Din al-Uthmani's trajectory, Saad al-Din al-Uthmani's sort of uh, work uh, was trying to bring Islam, normalize Islam's place in the public space that was his agenda. That was his life calling, to normalize Islam's place in the public space. So that is why critics are kinder to him. I would be kinder as well, because history does, you know, your, your own work and your own sort of uh, uh, calling in life should affect how we perceive your thesis. But Dr. Saad al-Din Osmani's thesis is very close to Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak. So it is, and, and there are many people, uh, and I, I, I make it just here, like somewhere here, because it, it, it has different motives, different incentives, and uh, also slight differences between uh, the, the, the two. Uh, theses. Now, you have then on the opposite side, you have people who say that Islam gave us a detailed prescription of, uh, in terms of governance. And that would be many of the tradition, many of the mashayikh, uh, whether they are called the taqlidi or sahawi, Many of the traditional mashayikh, whether they are the conventional or the sort of the people that are called Islamists, or they are all Islamists. Let's call them Islamiyin, because whether they are traditional or whether they are awakening type mashayikh, they are still coming from that paradigm. They're coming from the same paradigm. And they say that Islam actually provided a very good uh, sort of detailed uh, manifesto for governance, so like you just, and this, you know, some of those mashayikh went as far as saying, like, uh, and, and this is one of the, you know, uh, one of the good mashayikh, uh, the, the very brilliant mashayikh, contemporary mashayikh, Dr. Muhammad Yusri, um, who uh, goes as far as saying that there are 12,000 plus Textual reports, uh, uh, basically governing that area, Islam and governance, or the, syst the governance systems in Islam. Certainly, when you say this, the secular people <laughs> will be just completely frazzled, 
because 12,000, that means that there is no room whatsoever except for fuqaha and muhaddisin to be looking at chains of narrations and sort of mafhum al mukhalafa mafhum al muwafaqa there is and this politics will be dominated by fuqaha and muhaddisin sitting in rooms talking about you know al jarh wa ta'dil and mafhum al muwafaqa and muqalafa and stuff like this it, it is a, like a scary thing to them uh, but that's a good sizable portion of the uh, mashayikh now there are mashayikh that come in the middle and there are thinkers and mashayikh and many people that come in the middle of this and they want to say, and keep in mind, we have to say this to simplify. It is never three pronged. It is a spectrum. It's a spectrum. When we say one, two, three, that is us trying to simplify things. That is why I'm telling you, Saad al-Din al-Osmani would not be here. So maybe here, somewhere, it's a spectrum. We'll put him on the spectrum. So, yes, so, th this ambiguation or? Yeah, just with regard to the Mashiach, like Sheikh Sheikh Ali Abdul Azza, um, was, was there a certain threshold afterwards they said that we can apply uh, laws or, or statutes outside of the paradigm of the Islamic uh, uh, you know, tradition, for example? Like, was it after the application of Hadood? No, it's not about Hadood here, it's about the Islam and system of governance. Um, you know, like uh, Khilafa, monarchy, parliamentary, presidential, uh, you know, uh, institutions, uh, you know, constitutional sort of stuff. Um, Islam and systems of governance in general. And, and then you will have Mashaykh here, like for instance, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, who is Sheikh Saad al-Din al-Osmani or Dr. Saad al-Din al-Osmani is, is influenced by uh, him, but he took it a little bit further. And Sheikh Abdul Wahab Khalaf. Oh, Muhammad Abdu actually is closer, you know, somewhere here also. Sheikh Abdul Wahab Khalaf is here. Sheikh Shaltut, who, is, who was the Sheikh of Al Azhar, um, at some point is here. Uh, you know, one of the most significant people, uh, likely the most brilliant of them, was not a traditional Sheikh but was a, uh, the father of law in Arab countries, most of Arab countries and some Muslim countries as well. His, his name is Abdul Razak al-Sanhuri, Abdul Razak Basha al-Sanhuri. Uh, so this Egyptian fellow uh, was actually extremely brilliant. And uh, he, um, he, st he studied at uh, Sorbonne in, in uh, France, not Oxford, but his PhD thesis was about Khilafa and how to bring an alternative. So he's building on the system. He is developing the system. He's not casting it away. He's not throwing it away. He's trying to develop it. And that is what he did in general. In, in, in his basically uh, approach. I mean, you could certainly, there are things that uh, Dr. Abdul Razak Sanhuri uh, uh, can be uh, wrong about, of course. But in general, that was his approach. It is basically to build, to adjust uh, for the circumstantial variables. And his idea about the Khilafah was a genius idea, Al Jami' Al Mashriqiyya, which is something like the European Union. He thought of this before the European Union by many decades, to bring Muslims together and to have some semblance of unity, whether this is unified currency, whether this is, you know, uh, whatever, some semblance of unity, cooperation, uh, under a, un a type of union that will allow different Muslim states sort of enough independence to not feel suffocated. Because certainly, people in Bangladesh and Morocco, they have different sort of geographic, uh, cultural, contextual like variables and that to, to, to be ruled uh, from one area by someone who is 
in the other area is going to be uh, difficult. So he wanted to say, bring them under one umbrella. Uh, there are certain things that will give us that semblance of unity. Uh, you know, maybe muahada dfa mushtaraka. You know, so sort of uh, how do you say this in, in English? Uh, like defense treaties among themselves. Uh, maybe unified currency. Uh, so the organization of Islamic uh, cooperation is actually Abdul Razak al-Sanhuri's idea. But he wanted to develop this more to become more meaningful and more significant. Likewise, when it comes to Islam and usul al-hukm or Islam and nuzum al-hukm and systems of governance, he had the same idea. This group of people are saying that there are, there are general principles not, that are significant, that make some systems of governance compatible with Islam and some incompatible with Islam. So yeah. you could say that there is guidance, Islamic guidance, concerning systems of governance, but they are, the guidance belongs to the qawaid, the principles, not detailed, specific, uh, you know, restrictive rulings, although in some things there will be specific rulings. Of course, you may notice that this is where my inclination, that sort of group in the middle. I'm inclined to uh, their thesis. This comes from a concept that is established that there is a difference between ibadat and adiyat. And if you read Dr. Saad al-Din al-Uthmani's book, Al-Dawla al-Islamiyya al-Mafhum wal-Imkan, he does actually have a chapter on this that is uh, nice, helpful. He quotes Ibn Taymiyyah and Shatabi and Al-Ghazali uh, on the difference between Al-Ibadat and Al-Adiyat, that in the acts of worship you have detailed specific rulings that are straightforward, and there is not much room for rational uh, uh, sort of, uh, what, uh, departures you know, uh, from the detailed, the specific uh, rulings. Uh, because al ibadat is just about, you know, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to the area of adiyat, or it comes in the area of, usually translated as customs, but it just means worldly affairs, um, there is not that, you know. And the, there are guidelines that sort of, you should not, uh, rails on both sides, guardrails, but no specific rulings. And the asl is what? The default is ibaha. You just do whatever you want unless there is prohibition. Whereas the default here is hazr. Uh, you can't do anything unless you have proof on its uh, validity. That area of adiyat should the systems of governance belong here or belong here? Of course, it belongs here. How, but, but in the area of Adiyat, is it one uniform category, one undifferentiated category? Is there a difference between Ta'bir al Nakhl and Ahkam al Muzabana? Is there a difference between cross-fertilization of palm trees and the rulings of, you know, basically, or ahkam al-araya or khars al-nakhl, the rulings that pertain to selling dates and to basically uh, guessing the sort of the amount of the dates on the, the, the trees in, in exchange of fresh uh, dates for dried dates and there, there is. Why? What, what, which one? Uh, which one did the Prophet ﷺ say about "Antub alam bi umuri dunyakum"? You know the affairs of your dunya better. Cross fertilization. Cross fertilization. 
What is the difference between cross fertilization and Muzabana and the Araya? And When there is a moral value, when you expect that there would be khayr and sharr, good and evil, then Islam will have to have some say in it. Because ma taraka khayran illa dallana alayhi wa ma taraka sharran illa hadharana min. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi left us ala al-mahajja al-bayda, la iluha ka nahariha, la yazihu anha illa halik. Wherever there was good, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pointed us to it. Uh, and wherever there is bad, there is evil, he warned us from it. But again, at the same time, because, of, because politics is not like ibadat, uh, and there are huge circumstantial variables, then that guidance came in the form of principles. And principles that are comprehensible or not incomprehensible, comprehensible. And in this case, the maqasid, or the objectives, would be consequential or inconsequential, consequential. And you want to realize and cultivate those maqasid, so you want to understand the comprehensible ilal, or effective causes, so that you are not limiting yourself to the rigid, specific rulings, but you're able to accommodate the, the difference, the variables. So al adiyat here, whenever you, whenever you can think of khayr and sharr, uh, then the Islamic, there is no Islamic guidance in this regard. There is no Islamic guidance in terms of, you know, uh, chemical equations. Uh, you know, so if you add phosphorus to whatever, uh, magnesium, what do you get? Uh, stuff like this. Would you expect the Islamic guidance there? Would you expect the Islamic guidance in terms of, you know, uh, building bridges, for instance, or solving IT problems, uh, or things of that nature? Not really. Okay, because there is no khayr and sharr there. It's not about khayr and sharr here. This is, uh, there is no moral value here. It's not loaded with any more value. But whenever there is more value and there is khair and char, you will expect some Islamic guidance and this Islamic guidance can come in the form of detailed rulings, such as an ibadat or principles. Now siyasa, in terms of the things that are governed by, governed by principles, not detailed rulings, the siyasa belong closer to ibadat like marriage or does it belong closer to adiyat, you know, uh, chemical equations? It belongs closer to adiyat. Uh, it's not like marriage where it belongs closer to ibadat. No, it, is, it belongs closer to adiyat. So, meaning what? It is less regulated. It is less regulated. There are general principles, but it is much less regulated by the textual proofs. There is much more room for rational thinking, for developing our political philosophy, and so on and so forth. Therefore, whatever we talked about here, about the issue of rebellion against the hakim the problem arises and the contention between the different Islamic groups and, and secularists and Islamists and so on is because of rigidity and because of the lack of epistemic humility. Lack of epistemic humility. Particularly when it comes to, the, to religious people. Uh, you know, dogmatism is really a problem. And when you basically expand the certainty that you must have with regard to the existence of God, and his majesty and beauty, to, to become a way of thinking for you, like you're always trying to look sort of so confident and certain and so knowledgeable and so on top of it that whenever you find mashayikh of different worldviews discussing issues, you think, you know, 
these people are talking different languages. Why is the, the gap between them is so huge? Because of this, because of the lack of epistemic humility, because they want everything to have the same sort of uh, uh, certainty uh, that the, the rest of the, you know, the matters of Aqidah, you know, Arkan al Iman al Sitt. Uh, and then we have basically conflicting reports. You will find them not having, no, no, no matter where they're coming from, they will never have an issue because they can always twist it, deny it, sometimes lie, sometimes uh, basically cut and paste and sort of leave out the, the, the little part that, doesn't, that is a little inconvenient or that will require a little bit more work to explain. And that, that is basically the, the common behavior of people across the spectrum. So when it comes to al-Khuruj al al-Hakim now, we said that you have al-Kafir, you have al-Adil, and you have al-Ja'ir. And when it comes to al-Ja'ir, you have the one who is consistently Ja'ir, and you have the one who is randomly Ja'ir. Uh, they agreed on this, although they still agreed on this, but it, it depends on your, your ability. And certainly this applies to Muslim lands. You know, this applies to Muslim majority countries and Muslim lands. Uh, they agreed on this, that it is impermissible. They disagreed here. So when our political philosophy boils down to هل يجوز الخروج على الحاكم الجائر ولا لا يجوز يجوز الخروج على الحاكم الجائر لا يجوز الخروج على الحاكم الجائر and when you dichotomize a very nuanced issue uh, then you will have all the shouting and screaming between the, the, the two groups and then everybody will be uh, basically committing those sort of intellectual atrocities uh, with, without like an ounce of conscientiousness. Uh, okay, so when we talk about this issue here, we have to ask who, why, and how. And the final one, cost. Consequences, cost. So who's, who, why, how? Should there be a difference between, you know, and we're talking about the Jair here, and we're not talking about random. Uh, well, we're talking about someone who's like Jair, like consistently, or like bad for, for the country. So should there be a difference between individuals? Should the, the hadith of the Prophet be understood to differentiate between Ahl al halu wa al-Aqd, the Ummah, the Ummah that hired him. Can the Ummah that hired him fire him? Well, in the Hanbali Madhab, no, unless he asks to be fired. So if you have a Hakim Ja'ir, Ahl al halu wa al-Aqd must not fire him unless he asks to be fired. Of course, he's not going to ask. Uh, you know, uh, so they say that in al azl wa illa fala. So they they have the right to uh, basically re remove him uh, if he asks for it. Otherwise, no. That's al al halal al So you're basically holding the ummah becomes a captive. Can that be in this open statement? Huh? You know, um, so, so, so there is, you know, Kizil Kwat, Kizil Kwat. This is the Mexican myth. You know, the Aztecs, they had this god. And then when the Spaniards landed in Mexico, they thought, you know, it is like a, a, like a, a white, be white god with white beard and so on. So they, the, the Spaniards, they looked like... Uh, 
and then they surrendered. I would say that if we treat our rulers like Kizilquar, our destiny will be like the destiny of the Aztecs. Uh, it's just like, uh, it's amazing. Anyway, but. Think of, think of the French Revolution. Think of the French Revolution. Is there a difference between groups of people rebelling and think of the French Revolution? Who started the French Revolution? The members of the parliament. The parliament. It was started first at the parliament in the house of the people. You know, this was a revolution, despite all of the atrocities that were committed during the French Revolution, this was a revolution that was started by Ahl uh, al-Hal al You know, so there is a, there, that's one difference. Who's rebelling? Or who's firing him? Who's deposing him? And why? And that is when an Imam al-Jawaini makes the distinction in his Qiyas al-Umam, Keep in mind that we'll come to it later, uh, but uh, according to Shafi'i and Al-Qadim, it is permissible to rebel against the unjust ruler. According to Abu Hanifa, according to Al-Jassas' interpretation of Abu Hanifa, the madhab of Abu Hanifa, the clear madhab of Abu Hanifa, and his practice is the permissibility of rebelling against the unjust ruler. He supported Muhammad Sahab al Nafs Zakiya. He supported uh, Zaid ibn, ibn Ali. Uh, his, his statements, his actions are quite clear that it is permissible. The same applies to Imam Malik, who supported Muhammad Sahab al Nafs Zakiya and said to the people of Medina that the bay'ah that you have given to Al Mansur was bay'ah at Mukra, bay'ah under coercion, and it is not a valid one. So, so basically, uh, the, the, the question of uh, why and the, the distinction between al-jawr uh, al-basit, random, occasional, light, not too bad, versus you know the sharr al-ladhi stashra and fisq al-ladhi ammo tamman and so on. And this is the one that we're talking about that you could rebel against. And how? How is it is is many times people who say that you can't rebel against the ruler, they want to suppress any dissent without you know asking that question. What is it that they what is it that they uh, prohibited? Is it the armed uh, struggle uh, or rebellion? Or is it popular, populist or popular uprising? Uh, is it civil uh, sort of uh, dissent? Like, how are, how are you going to prevent this when the Prophet وسلم, said, إذا عجزت أمتي عن أن تقول للظالم أنت ظالم فقد تودع منها أو أو خير الجهاد سيد شلاء حمزة ورجل ورجل قام عند سلطان جائر فأمره ونها فقتله وخير الجهاد كلمة حق عند سلطان جائر إن لم تأمره بالمعروف تنهى عن الملك أو شك الله يعمكم بعذاب and the 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 tons of reports about you know, uh, condemning evil and commend and supporting good, and even with the, with the hukam, you know, the, the best jihad or the best form of jihad is to speak the truth uh, against a, uh, a uh, an unjust ruler and, and things of that nature. So, it, this rebellion is it armed or uh, basically civil dissent and popular uprising and so on? Some people would like to extend this from arm to any form of dissent, and that is just other nonsense. So these are, and then at what cost? What cost? That is why Imam Jwani also in Riyasi, he makes the freak or between, um, he says, 
if the mutawakka from if it's what is expected from uh, deposing him is worse than the waqa, well, the, the existent reality, then you refrain. Common sense, of course. You know, but if it is not, if it is believed that the waqa is worse than the mutawakka, then you depose him. So now, this is who is deposing here? This is Ahl al Halwa al Aqd, the very people who gave him the contract, the very people who gave him uh, the contract. Why are we having so much disagreement nowadays? Because there was a switch uh, in the fourth century. In the first three centuries, uh, the dominant view among Muslims was the permissibility of rebellion. The dominant view among Muslims was the permissibility of rebellion. And we have talked about Hassan ibn Zubair, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Hassan, Ibrahim, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn al uh, and, and the Qurra. So we've talked about the Sahaba, the cream of the crop of the Tabi'een, Tabi'i Tabi'een. These people did not only allow it, they actually rebelled, rebelled. And then came, you know, after many defeats of the rebels, uh, after they were defeated many times, uh, the insurgent rebels, came Ibn Mujahid al-Basri al-Mutakallim and reported consensus that it is not permissible to rebel against the unjust ruler. He died in 360 after Hijra. Uh, and he was a great scholar, but at the end of the day, he was Basri. He comes from an area that is deeply traumatized by defeat. Dayr al-Jamajim happened uh, to the Qurra of al-Basra, 4,000 of them. They were massacred. They were defeated very badly. And it's an area that is traumatized. At the same time, how could you report the consensus when you were extremely geographically limited? Like, you know, you're in the fourth century, and you're reporting consensus about this issue. It, it, Imam ibn Hazm says, had he been mute, it would have been better for him to not speak that falsehood. Because he knows that, I mean, you know, Imam ibn Hazm used to have his own uh, way of expressing himself. Uh, so he, he says that, you know, having known that, that Munkir al Ijma' Kafir, having known that the one who denies al Ijma' is Kafir, and having known, you know, all of the, all of the precedents, you know, from Al, al Hussein and Ibn Zubayr and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and claiming this consensus after knowing this, it would have been better for him to be mute than to speak this falsehood. So, uh, so then, he, uh, then we have a shift where, traditionally speaking, the majority uh, sided with the prohibition of rebellion against the unjust ruler. The, the, even within the mazahib that were uh, heavily, you know, their imams supported with money, with, with resources, the, the, their imams recruited, their imams recruited insurgent rebels. And then you have the switch over time. Uh, and then you, you have like Al uh, Jassas was reporting what the Imam Abu Hanifa actually did and, and said, and so on. But you have someone like Imam Al Tahawi, who's a great Hanafi as well, leading like a different sort of. Uh, propagating or promoting a different interpretation. And then, under pressure, in every you know, society, the scholars are under pressure. W w do you think that there would be pressure for them to say it is OK to rebel against the unjust rulers? <laughs> They're living under unjust rulers most of the time. So there has to be a consideration for the pressure. So under pressure, it became as if it is a done deal, you know, uh, that it is forbidden. Now, am I saying it is not, am I saying that you sh you, we should rebel? No, I'm not saying this. Of course not. I am not supporting rebellion against unjust rulers. I am saying that this 
جائز and ممنوع this dichotomy is too unbecoming, unbefitting of an ummah like us. We have to develop our political philosophy to be more nuanced than just saying جائز or ممنوع. To take in consideration who, why, how, and at what cost, and to have a nuanced approach to the reports. Because if you claim that those reports are quite clear, extremely clear, whether you are on this side or that side, you're not being honest. If you claim that the reports are quite clear, if you forbid you know, rebellion against the unjust rulers, and you claim that the, the, the reports are quite clear and there, sh there is no room for controversy, then you are ignoring some reports. Uh, and then you are claiming that those Sahaba and those Tabi'een, the cream of the crop, missed a very clear, sort of, the, the clear implications of the reports that you have come to understand and to be certain of and to be quite clear on. Things are so clear to you like the sun in the middle of a summer day, but they were not to Ibn Zubayr and the Sahaba and the Tabi'een that were with him, or al Hussein, or you know, the, the, the Qurra, uh, uh, the Shabi, and Sa'id ibn Jubayr, and ibn Abi Layla, and the people who actually fought you know, themselves. Now, they get stuck, and sometimes they try to figure out how to answer this, and then we get into takfir, because, you know, and some people, uh, because of the tradition is heavily slanted, particularly later, uh, in favor of prohibition of rebellion against unjust rulers, many people that want to rebel, they get sort of forced into takfir. Those rulers are not Muslim. And then you get into this problem because that's the only way, basically, to, to have the freedom to rebel. Those rulers are not Muslim. So why are they not Muslim? They don't rule by that which Allah, uh, uh, yeah. So, okay, and they, they, they promote secularism. Many Muslims sympathize with Erdogan, including myself. I sympathize with him. I, I think that he's done great things for Turkey, but he's promoting secularism. And they say that you know he's just doing it gradually. It's been 21 years. Uh, okay, you know, grad, uh, you know, one generation is 40 years. But again, at the same time, you don't have to promote it. Uh, you don't have, you know, the, you, the whole system that you're using is basically a modern European system. Uh, the fact that you have like sort of passionate speeches, or the fact that you have some semblance of uh, Islamism here and there does not change the fact that the whole system is, this whole structure uh, is not really. So then, then you, you fall into inconsistency. Or some people that like to be consistent, and radical people always are very consistent, uh, because if you're, if you're at one end of the spectrum, you're, 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 you're basically back to the wall. You will be consistent. So, uh, so, so then if you want to be consistent, you make takfir of Erdogan as well, and many people do, you know. Uh, so it, you know, that's the way you can actually continue to be consistent and be happily consistent. It's, it's sort of atrocious and you know, ex like uh, reckless and evil, but, but that's what some people do. Anyway, so going back to this, you will have a hadith, for instance, like Sayakun Umara Tarifuna Minhum Watun Kirun. Sayakun Umara Tarifuna Minhum Watun Kirun. Feman Nabazahum Nabazahum Naja. Woman Atazalahum. ومن اعتزلهم سلم ومن خالطهم هلك سيكون خلوف and in some reports أمراء 
سيكون أمراء وسيكون خلوف أمراء سيكون خلوف three different types of reports but this word is actually authentic chain wise is authentic أمراء يقولون ما لا يفعلون ويفعلون ما لا يؤمرون فمن جاهدهم بيده فهو مؤمن ومن جاهدهم بلسانه فهو مؤمن ومن جاهدهم بقلبه فهو مؤمن اه في الخلوف وليس بعد ذلك حبة القرض من الايمان ان في الامراء لا ايمان بعد ذلك so uh, now do you know how these are reinterpreted they are reinterpreted نبذهم here hmm? oh so there will be uh, Umara rulers um, that you will recognize as commendable or con condemnable some of their practices or behaviors. Whoever nabazahum, whoever, and that, because that's the, the issue here. Whoever nabazahum will be uh, will, will will survive, will prosper. Whoever uh, separates or distances himself from them will be safe, and whoever mixes with them will be destroyed. And these are two authentic reports. Imam Ahmad de-authenticated de this report, but the chain is authentic. And they figured out ways to reinterpret them. There will be, uh, and, and certainly the asl of the thing is in Bukhari and Muslim, that doesn't have the word umara, khuluf, is in Bukhari and Muslim, but the word umara itself. And even if the word umara is not there, khuluf, it, it means generations. And certainly, if you're talking about fighting them, you're actually making it, taking it a step forward, and you're fighting the whole society, not just the umara. So, <laughs> so there will be uh, generations or, or umara rulers uh, who do what they don't. يقولون ما لا يفعلون. They say what they don't do, and they do what they don't say. They're like hypocritical. In other words, whoever fights against them with his hand is a believer. Whoever fights against them with his tongue is a believer. Whoever fights against them with his uh, heart is a believer. There is no belief after this. So the people who want, basically, to interpret this away, they will say, Nabazahum here, whoever. This means fights against them. Munabaza is basically opposition. Uh, and it is actually violent opposition. Uh, but they say, Nabazahum here bilisani. He basically speaks against them. And then some of them would come back and say, you know, you know is Nabazahum bilisani only in private. You can't. <laughs> like, so please, get me an appointment with them. Uh, huh? You won't return. <laughs> yeah. And then, OK. So, how do we interpret this away? Do we interpret this? We, we figured out three ways to interpret this away. One way is uh, it is the da'if. Imam Ahmad you know, de authenticated it. That, that has the, the umara part. Uh, and, and that's basically, you know, that, that is basically it. And then, Another way, which is a little creative, is no, it is, it is actually not da'if, but then to you change the monker with your hand if you can, the specific monker, not to depose the ruler, but let us say the ruler, for instance, um, set up shops to sell wine. You change that monker if you can. And most likely you can't because the ruler is there. And unless you depose the ruler and you change that moniker, you'll get arrested and they'll be, be thrown in jail. But they're saying that this is what the hadith means. You do not depose the ruler, but you change the specific moniker uh, that the ruler you know, uh, commit, committed or, or other people have committed. So then. Then, uh, and then they have, so what about all the history? They will have 
acrobatic ways of interpreting the whole history away. Acrobatic ways. Their counterparts on the opposite side are not less dogmatic, by the way. Are not less dogmatic, by the way. Because there is a genre of a hadith that are established in Bukhari and Muslim against rebellion. And, and there is, you know, the, the, the tradition is heavily inclined towards the prohibition of, your, of, of rebellion. So you will have a hadith like, Tasma' wa tuti'a lil amir. Tasma' wa tuti'a lil amir. Wa in akhava malak wa daraba zahrak. Wa alla hadith abad ibn al-Samit. Wa alla nunazi'a al-amra ahlahu illa an taraw kufran bawahan. عندكم من الله فيه برهان حديث من أتاكم وأنتم جميعا على رجل واحد يريد أن يشق عصاكم ويفرق جماعتكم فاقتلوه حديث من رأى من أميره شيئا يكرهه فليصبر عليه فإنه من فارق الجماعة فمات فميتته ميتة جاهلية We can go on and on. There, you know, there is like a, like a whole genre of hadith, and this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim highly authentic. So you listen and obey to the ruler, even if he took your money and flogged your back. You listen and obey to the people in charge, unless you see kufr, disbelief, clear cut, that you have like uh, proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on it being kufr. Whoever comes to you while you are together under one man wanting to um, compromise your solidarity and disrupt your union, kill him. Whoever uh, notices, observes something he dislikes about his ruler, let him show patience for whoever separates from the community. Uh, even the hand, one hand span, even to the extent of one hand span. And dies, his, he will die in a state of jahiliya, pre-Islamic ignorance. Okay. Unless you see kufr. So that means al-ja'ir, zulm, is not kufr. Then you don't rebel if there is no kufr. Uh, even, you don't rebel if there is a transgression, even if he took your money and flogged your back. If you see something that you dislike, show patience. If someone rebels, kill him. If you're under one man uh, and someone rebels, kill him. So all of this with the fact that, you know, the same people that uh, will disregard the consensus are the people who use similar consensuses also. And that is inconsistent. You know, so Ibn Mujahid al-Basri reported this consensus. And now we repeated it. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hajar repeated it. So, if these are your icons, and if the, you know, you will just have to give, give respect to that consensus because you're using similar consensuses. Unless you will, you will provide justification, and it is possible to provide justification. But we're dealing with a genre of just strong hadith that we will have to talk about. So the, to give a, a, like an answer of 
No, it is permissible to rebel against the unjust ruler that is dogmatic, insufficient, not taking in consideration all of these ahadiths. There has to be a lot of work, basically, to find a way to reconcile between all of those. And so, you know, how can we uh, basically understand this? So Ibn Hazm, in, you know, in more than one of his books, provides explanation for each one of those. Because Ibn Hazm has a rational argument. He says, OK, you're saying that unless he shows this belief, we will not rebel against him. Assume he took as his supporters and aides Jews and Christians only and uh, basically uh, removed the, 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 the Muslims from positions of power, took as his aides Jews and Christians, and killed every Muslim man and raped every Muslim woman. Is that disbelief? No, it's not. OK, so then would you say you will let him do that until he finishes you off? And then you would have said, like, a, like an, sort of like you have made an, uh, posited a, like an insane position. Uh, and then he said, فَمَا زِنَّا نَتَنَزَّلْ مَعَهُمْ وَنَحُطْ يعني مِنَ الْمِنَ الْمِنْ قَدْرِ مِنَ الْمِنْ قَدْرِ الْقَتْلَى وَالْغَيْرُ Until we come down to one Muslim man being killed or one Muslim woman being raped. If they stop somewhere in the middle, they'll be inconsistent. If they, so, so he, he uh, Hazmi, you know, was, was really brilliant. So he says that this man is basically, and, and certainly there will be brilliant uh, responders also. So they, will, they may say, no, it's not the same. You know, killing one man or one woman is not like killing all Muslim men and women. If he kills all Muslim men and women, we will know that the, the, the basically the basis of this is their Islam, not grievances against this man and one and one. But Ibn Hazm says, says to them, what about nine tenths? What about eight tenths of Muslims? What about one quarter of Muslims? What about, what about like 100? What about 50? What about one? Where do you stop? So you either say, no, we will let him and we will not rebuild even if he killed us all. Or you will have to put a line somewhere. And if you put the line somewhere, there will be inconsistency between the before and after. You will not have any coherent argument. We will not have any coherent argument, and there will be some inconsistency. So uh, then he says, every one of those has to be understood within the context of everything else. So if he took your money and flogged your back, Justifiably, or even out of ijtihad. So he made ijtihad. How many times the judges can err in their ijtihad or make a mistake in their ijtihad? So if he flogged your back and you know that you are innocent, be patient. Because he did this out of ijtihad. So that's what Ibn Hazm says about this. And for everyone, he comes up with a uh, a reasonable argument. The bottom line is this is not a dichotomy. There are many important questions to answer before you give, uh, you could have a coherent uh, position on this issue. Who, how, who, why, and how, and at what cost? There is a difference between al and the rest of the people. There is a difference between someone who randomly make transgresses and someone who's transgressing all the time, causing corruption on earth. There is a difference between armed struggle and popular uprising. And there is a difference between when the mutawakka is worse than the waqa, or the, the expected, you know, uh, after rebellion is worse than uh, the, the present, or the present is worse than uh, the expected, these are all things that have to, to be taken in consideration. Of course, the Prophet comes 
you know, to teach us uh, about moving from the wilderness to civility. Of course, the prophet will have emphasis on these were feudal tribes. They have never known any stability. So of course, the prophet will be preaching to them about patience and about civility and about union and about all of these things, you know, to bring those feudal tribes under like one system into a union that was a huge undertaking. We do expect the Prophet ﷺ to have said these things, but we have to understand them correctly. And we also have to understand the circumstantial variables and the changes in world conditions and build a, a coherent political philosophy. I think as Islamists, change is huge and we need to work on the moral and the spiritual aspects because this uh, infrastructure, the moral and the spiritual infrastructure is essential for change. I think Islamists need to have uh, changed their organizations into movements that spread uh, basically horizontally, not vertically in the society that permeates through the body, through different institutions. It's, we're not talking about disbanding all uh, basically uh, teamwork or uh, collective efforts, but we're talking about avoiding rigid hierarchies that will cause partisanship and counter sort of efforts and responses that Islam permeates through the society like water and roses, uh, oil and olives, uh, move horizontally organizations that share a common vision, move towards a common goal, connected spiritually and emotionally, not, uh, not uh, organizationally. Uh, and that is, and, and then build the, you know, focus on the spiritual and moral because these are the things that will uh, connect us and these are the things that are not controversial and needed as infrastructure to build on them the social and political. The social and the uh, political. And then defer ideological uh, contra struggles until you have a good system of governance. A good system of governance is uh, the, 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 the aspiration of many, many people in the Muslim countries, not only Islamists, it's the aspiration of many people. Work with them towards that and the ideological differences can be deferred until we have more civility and until we have mechanisms, procedures, by which we can resolve our conflicts without too much bloodshed and too much chaos. That's the prescription for uh, my, my prescription. Anyway.